Welcome to Live with the Author, Bridge to Practice. This is Reading Research Quarterly's new Skype interview series where we get to meet the fantastic Reading Research Quarterly authors and have their research brought to life. We have today here with us two of our fantastic authors. Can you guys introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. I'm Angela Conan. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida. Uh, I'm Jillian Mertens. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Florida. No. Fantastic. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to do this research? Sure. So our article is called, I'm Always Kind of Double Checking, Exploring the Information Seeking Practices of Expert Generalists. And I started thinking about this probably as a high school teacher. So we are very interested in understanding how people find and evaluate information online. And both of us taught high school and middle school, noticed that kids had a really hard time um, with figuring out what information was credible, what wasn't. And in the 10 years since I've been in the classroom, I guess almost 10 years now, um, that has only gotten more and more complicated. So we were inspired to figure out what are people who are really good at information seeking? What do they do and, and how do they behave online? Very cool. So what did what your study find? Um, so we used James G's idea of doing, knowing, and being, these practice-based identities, um, and we ended up finding that there were these trends across three different practice-based identities, so journalists, um, academic librarians, and nonfiction children's book authors. Uh, and so we found that, in general, they're curious, they're skeptical but committed to accuracy, they're persistent, um, they know how to go about learning about something new, they know how to navigate the digital landscape, how to find information and where it gets stored. Um, they know how to orient themselves. They can do that. They can dig for information. Uh, they know how to ask a good question. We use a tool well. Uh, and they know how to synthesize during their search. I think some of the ways that we've taught research as teachers have often included breaking steps apart and having product kind of be separate from the process and having students work in these very contained systems of articles that we found for them. Uh, and we found that our experts had a process for navigating things they weren't familiar with um, and had, as well as uh, reliance on things that they were. So that's really interesting. So it sounds like there's like a knowledge, right? There's this idea of like they know where to go, they know a process to work within, but there's also dispositions. There's this curiosity and the skepticism that they bring to whatever task they're, you know, taking on. Yeah, and I think that's something that really interests both of us. Mm -hmm. We, as literacy teachers and researchers, think about literacy as more than just a set of skills. Right and it's a way of being in the world and as we think about how we teach our kids, our students, our children um, to engage with the information they find online, there are skills but then there's also, we know from a lot of previous research, you might have all the skills in the world to evaluate information but until you want to, until you decide, oh I better double check this, um, you're not going to do it. So we think about literacy as more than just you know a set of a set of skills to be taught in isolated lessons, but more of a way of being across um, all kinds of information seeking contexts. Yeah, it seems like that link to purpose seems yeah. really important as well. So, what would you tell teachers based off of your research? Well, I think one thing that we, we work with teachers a lot, and um, there's a line between sort of recognizing that not being intimidated by the internet ourselves. So mm -hmm. we know some teachers with whom we work are like, it's just too big of an issue right. to deal with online information seeking. So we think understanding that everybody makes mistakes online, everybody's been tricked by something at some point or another yeah. is one thing we think about. On the other hand, we also think all the research shows us that we don't all know it already. And some, some teachers also think, well, the kids already know how to do this. I already know how to do this. So what's the point? I work with high achieving 11th graders. Mm -hmm. So there's finding that balance between not being overwhelmed and not being overconfident. Yeah. Um, and then Jillian, I think, has worked with more teachers in practice yeah. too. I, I think one thing I think about is this idea of looking to people who do this really well to structure curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. Teachers as a group of people are often like, con I think we're conveners of, of knowledge, we're connecting our students to other ways of being. And so helping kids try on the identities of journalists or librarians or some sort of information convener helps them see why those identities are important um, and potentially integrate them into themselves. 
Uh, and I think too, the more the internet becomes like a, a way of being for kids, they're on their phones, the less we should be separating research from information seeking in the classroom. Um, it's not just academic projects, it's living your life online. And so how do we help our kids get ready to do that? Very cool, so it's that authenticity, it's that bringing in your real lived experience and encouraging kids to take on those identities that you're talking about, encouraging kids to be skeptical, curious, and to sort of develop their own processes, it sounds like, with teacher scaffolding um, yes. for obtaining information. What would you tell principals and policymakers related to your study? Hmm. Yeah, I think something we'd love to see more of is both vertical and horizontal uh, instruction around online information seeking. So a lot of times this is happening in maybe an English class under a research paper heading. Um, we see social studies teachers taking on sourcing a little bit in their classes, but nowhere else. We also don't see a lot of this instruction starting until, I don't know, sixth, seventh, maybe eighth grade. Um, so thinking through principal, um, ha helping principals think through making the curricular space. This isn't currently tested in our mm -hmm. state. Uh, it's not currently tested in most states that we're aware of. Um, so how do we prioritize online information literacy, make opportunities, developmentally appropriate opportunities across the curriculum. It does look a little different in science to look for information than yes. it does in English. So that's also an area that we're really interested in further exploring. How do we find cross-curricular opportunities to reinforce these identities and skills, but also to differentiate? Um, so I think it does take a whole school, it takes a lot of thinking, but we also don't think it takes a radical overhaul. If your state's a common core state, you know, this is implied in a lot of the common core standards, yes. though not tested very often. So I do think, I think there's the space if you're willing to, to look for it. So it seems like being really strategic, saying, yeah. all right, let's talk. When is this happening? When yes. should it be happening? And I'm hearing from you that it should be happening starting early. Like we can ha ask these questions, you know. I happen to know a kindergartner came up to me the other day with a question about something and they searched it up and they took the first an answer that yes. was there. That so, doesn't change, turns yeah. out. <laughs> right. So, start, so thinking about where it's going to be taught across the curriculum, both in terms of content, but then developmentally. Um, right. so it's a great start. And I think we also see places in schools where we have contradictory information yes. happening in different places. So um, we've started thinking about things as credibility, common sense, and I'm putting that in quotes because it's not correct, <laughs> nor is it sensible, but things like a .org is better than a .com. You know, this has somehow seeped into the water and <laughs> teachers are yes. saying this to students, That's and it's true. completely not true. Um, and so if you have the one teacher who's really trying to focus on digital information literacy and really working hard, but then down the hall, somebody is, you know, sharing something that's maybe not quite as, um, as accurate. As updated. Yeah, yeah. You, get, you get kids who start to um, sort of play the game. I know in this class I do this, in this class I do that. So trying to have conversations. But not in my lived experience. Right. Overall, right. And there's no teacher there. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So that kind of leads me to my next question, which is, as parents, what do we do based off of your research? You know, I, I live with a fifth grader and a second grader, and <laughs> we think a lot about this stuff, probably too much. They, mm -hmm. they are tired of me um, asking them how they know something is true. But mm -hmm. I think really there's a lot of research coming out that, that should make us skeptical about how much time our kids are spending online and how... Um, much how reliant they've become on some of these devices. And I think one thing that we learned from our experts is that not everything about information seeking needs to happen online. Yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what the journalists and librarians and um, children's book authors were telling us was, well, if I didn't understand this topic, I would go ask somebody, like in yeah. real life. Yeah. So part of what I tell my kids is like, hey, if you encounter something, like let's talk about it. Let's let's try to decide, does this make sense or not? So I think one thing, we talk a lot about offloading credibility judgments. We're inundated with so much information, we all have to decide. We can't investigate it all for ourselves. So who are we gonna trust? And sometimes that's an online space, 
uh, fact-checking websites, Snopes, you know, particularly trusted sources of news information. But other times that's moving out of the online space and having conversations in real life. So that's one thing I think about a lot. I also think about I teach my kids some really basic search skills, yes. you know, about how to how to open new tabs, how to double check information, things like that as it comes up in their life. And the so, other- I'm, so I'm hearing from you again, it's this knowledge, right? You're teaching them skills, but it's yes. this bigger idea of both questioning, how do you know that that's accurate? But then there's also this idea that there's lots of different information sources that we can go to and we can work with and we can get authentic information. Help, yeah, I think the practice of helping helping kids in general be the kinds of kinds of people who want the yes. right information or who want to take multiple pieces of conflicting information and kind of lay them against each other and make some sense of that. And I think kids in general are really good at that, mm-hmm. but school teaches them not to trust their prior experiences and not to validate their own knowledge. And so the more we can get younger kids doing that in their own experiences, then it may be easier as we move towards digital space. No, I keep thinking about my own children and their desire to ask Siri questions. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's sort of the next frontier is the the not, you know, the, the non-visual um, ways that we're encountering information sometimes or or how how much they like to ask Siri questions and get Siri's answers and how we think about that kind of information. To me, that's sort of like the next the next frontier of um, what is happening with information gathering and information. And, and that makes me think even like of different levels of information, right? You can ask Siri, like, what's the temperature? And yes. there's probably an answer, right? And if Siri's wrong, if she says 30 degrees out and it's hot out, you can pretty much know that Siri is off. But yes. then there's much bigger questions. Siri, what is racism? Siri, right. what is power? Um, yes. You know, these bigger concepts that I don't really think Siri can start to think about nuances. So it's that idea yes. that, you know, information is pre-nuanced. And so yes. our sources yeah. and how and we think about information needs yeah. to be similarly nuanced. And Siri won't list her sources out loud, too. And so she might say power is X, Y, Z, but not say according to Webster Merriam. Yeah. Um, she may just say it. And so how do kids react when a humanoid voice is saying <laughs> the truth? Um, and so I think that there's just something um, interesting happening there that we're going to have to grapple with as educators later on. Yeah, and I think that leads me to our next question. Where do we go next? <laughs> mm. So I think the next steps we've been taking have been working with teachers to do some of the things we've already said. So developing curricular um, opportunities that move across the disciplines. That's that's the work that we're doing. Yeah, so we have um, a science teacher, a history teacher, and an ELA teacher at the eighth grade level. And we're getting together and kind of talking about the results of our research and how do we embed that across the school year so students are having opportunities to play around with these identities and Mm -hmm. skills and build that knowledge in a a way that keeps cycling through all, all the disciplines. So we've got sort of the identity that we're hoping to be the outcome (laughs) based on the work that we've done. But how do you get there? And how does that look in science and history? And so we're we're partnering with teachers to try to figure that out. Yeah, just kind of distilling it down to these core skills and then in what order do students develop them and and how do you scaffold identity development, which is, Mm -hmm. I think, something that educators in general have have worked on for a while. (laughs) Well, I can't wait to hear what comes next. I mean, I'm super fascinated. I want to see the results of that study next. And if you are interested in getting more information, you can read our article on (laughs) Reading Research Quarterly's website. Um, And I'm sure you can contact the authors as well. Thank you guys so much for being here with us. Thank Thank you. Thank you.